Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. If you'd like to read along with us, get your Bibles. We're going to begin in the book of Acts, chapter number 19. We're going to see Paul in his third missionary journey at Ephesus. And then we're going to turn our attention to the book of 1 Corinthians. And we'll explain that when we get to that. But first, we're going to be looking at uh, some miracles that glorify Christ and validate the ministry and the message that the Apostle Paul had to say as he ministered to the people in Ephesus. We know that he was there for at least a couple years. Some people think that he may have been there as many as three years. So I'll begin reading in chapter 19 and verse 11 of the book of Acts. And this is Paul in the early portions of his third missionary journey. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the name of of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did also. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to both Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on all of them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds, and also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together, and they burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So these unusual miracles by the hands of Paul certainly glorified God and validated Paul as God's minister and the message that he proclaimed. And they certainly uh, validated God's power working in the midst of their people. And as is often the case, there were people that observed the things that were going on who were not called or commissioned by God for such a ministry, and yet they wanted to do and to perform like what Paul had done, and so they tried to do what he had done, to imitate what Paul had done. And it got them beat up and humiliated uh, by the man who was possessed by an evil spirit. So we should do our best at whatever God leads us to do, but be satisfied with that, and not covet gifts or callings that other people have been given. And next week, when we get into some of the gifts of the Spirit that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, we'll go over that thought again. Most all the other people heard of these things that had happened, and the Lord's name was magnified, even though fear had fallen upon most of them. And the result was that many repented from their involvement in idols and magic and confessed, and they brought their material and burned them before the people. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So that was quite an interesting passage that we read, wasn't it? And remember that Paul was called to do that, and he was empowered by God to do that and by God's Holy Spirit. But these other people that tried to imitate the things that he had done had not received that same calling, and it ended up in failure. And as I said, next week, we'll talk about that more when we get into the gifts of the Spirit. Most Bible scholars believe that Paul wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians during the time that he was ministering in Ephesus in his third missionary journey. And so as is the case when we go through 
the Bible in a chronological fashion. Those of you who have gone through the Bible with us chronologically through the Reese Chronological Bible are understanding and aware of the way he presents the scriptures in a chronological fashion. Whenever Paul would have been in a particular place where many Bible scholars believe that he would have authored many of his epistles or letters from, then Reese would interject those in that particular place before he moves on. And that's the case that we're now going to do in that we're going to turn our attention away from the book of Acts and the early stages of Paul's third missionary journey and look at what he had to say in the letters that he wrote of First and Second Corinthians. And those are pretty lengthy books. So we're not going to read all of the passages and all of the verses in those books, but we're going to look at some highlights, ones that I think that would be relevant to us and important for us to understand. Although I recognize that there might be portions that we skip over that are ones that you particularly might like or have interest in. So if that's the case, I apologize for that. So we're going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter number one. And I'm going to read the first three verses to kind of get us off on the right foot. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, Remember that Paul teaches us and the Bible teaches that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is considered to be a saint. Even though in some denominations and groups to be sainted means you have to have probably died and have done many wonderful things during your lifetime. The Bible teaches and presents the idea that all who believe and trust in Christ are referred to as saints. So he says, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So in the very first verse, he mentioned this man, Sosthenes, and he refers to him as our brother, which the way Paul writes and speaks, that means he's a fellow believer. He's our brother in Christ. Sosthenes, we first read about, in the 18th chapter of Acts, when Paul was in Corinth. And I'm going to read Acts 18, verse 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Here in this letter, Paul refers to Sosthenes as our brother. So we take it that he had become a believer, a Christ follower, at one time, he had been the leader of the synagogue in Corinth, and now he's become a believer, and he's with Paul when he's penned this letter. So he says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, if I say that right, it's kind of a tongue twister, our brother. So now we'll drop down to verse, and then he goes on to say, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in verse number three. And that's a very familiar phrase that Paul uses in I believe every one of his letters with the exception of the book of Galatians. So now we'll come to verse four through nine and he will begin to speak a little bit about spiritual gifts. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short and no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul says that the Christians in Corinth came behind in no gift. I believe that means that every one of the spiritual gifts were present in some form and in some number in the church in Corinth. And as I mentioned earlier, next week we'll get into chapters 12, 13, and 14 and speak in depth a little more about spiritual gifts and what Paul had to say. But here he tells them at the beginning of this letter, you have come behind and no spiritual gift. In other words, all of the gifts are present in some of the people in your church family. 
However, Paul will have to correct them for errors that they have in the way that they practice and covet various gifts, and that will be part of what we look at next week. Note that they were also waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation, remember, there's a Greek word, apocalypsis, which means a revealing or an unveiling. So when he says that they were eagerly waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, that means he's referring to when the Lord will come back to rapture the church, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that you and I in our day should also be just as eagerly anticipating his return. So now we'll drop down to verse 10 through 17 and see what Paul has to say about some divisions and some priorities. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same manner and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, which is a, another name for Peter, or I am of Christ. And then he asked this rhetorical question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Are you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, he's wanting to get across to these people that the divisions that they're, they're having and Various groups saying, I'm following Jesus, I'm following Paul, I'm following Peter, I'm following Apollos. That's not a good thing. And he's going to point out to them, and that's why he asked these rhetorical questions. He says, I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So there are factions and cliques that seem to happen too easily and too often in this church in Corinth, but I'm also afraid that we would have to admit that it happens too often and too easy in our churches today. Paul's comment about this issue of baptism in verse 17 has brought about some controversy in modern Christendom. There are some people that try to build a doctrine over verse 17 saying that water baptism is not meant for our dispensation of the New Testament church age or the age of grace. I don't think that I completely agree with that. I understand what they're trying to say. And there are some people that say that if you require a person to be physically water baptized before they can be assured of their salvation, then you're adding something to the grace and the faith of Christ. And I agree with that, that baptism is not necessary for salvation. My opinion is that is it, it is an act of obedience and it is an outward witness or testimony of what goes on spiritually on the inside of us where Paul says in the book of Romans, we are to consider ourselves to have been crucified with Christ, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk a newness of life. And so we're not physically baptized with Christ. In that instance, baptism with baptized with Christ, I believe is a reference to being totally immersed in the identity of being with him and part of his body. But we'll deal with, more, with that more when we go on just wanted you to be aware that there's some people that take that particular verse and believe that baptism is not meant for us in our day. And so we come to verse 18, a very important verse in chapter one. And this will be the last verse that we look at in chapter one, and then we'll drop down to chapter three. But verse 18 of chapter one of 1 Corinthians says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And that means perishing spiritually, not just physically dying. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's a, worth, a verse worth memorizing, if you, especially after you understand it and apply it to your life. 
that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now we're going to drop down to chapter number three and look at a couple of verses, 16 and 17. And we'll see that he's going to tell us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then we'll also look at some verses very similar to that in chapter six. Verse 16 and 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter three. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now I'm going to leapfrog over to chapter six and read verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have been given from God and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So during the time of the old covenant dispensation, there was either a temple or a tabernacle present. But for almost all of the time of the New Testament church age, the age of grace or the dispensation of grace, there has not been a physical temple. But Paul brings out that you and I as believers have become the temple of the Holy Spirit because he dwells within us. The temple or the tabernacle was called the dwelling place of God because that's where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat above it. And that represented God's presence on planet Earth. But when the temple was gone, and this, in addition to that, when we read in the book of Ezekiel, when Judah went into captivity to Babylon, the glory of the Lord left the temple. And so now you and I, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In our dispensation, there is no physical temple, but the Bible teaches that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. There will be a third temple built, and it will be there during the time of the tribulation period, we know, because the Bible speaks that the Antichrist will desecrate it. The Lord Jesus referred to it in the 15th verse of Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse as the abomination of desolation. And then there will be another temple that either will be refurbished or built new for the millennial kingdom. But we'll deal with that on down the road as well. So Revelation tells us that there will not be a temple in New Jerusalem. And I believe that that will be our address in heaven if we have such a thing, because New Jerusalem is identified as being the bride of Christ. And we find that in chapter 21. In fact, I'll read in chapter 21 of Revelation verses 20 through 22 through 26. But I saw no temple in it, speaking of New Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb, speaking of Christ, is the light. Remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and their honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut all day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So looking now at back in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 4, <clears throat> we won't read from it. But the emphasis of chapter four is to show that we are stewards of the mysteries of God and that we're to be faithful in teaching and revealing and sharing that mystery of God, the salvation of God with other people. Chapter five is about the purging out of the leaven. Leaven represents sin or scriptural error in the world. And so we're to purge leaven out from the church body because a little leaven leavens the whole lump, as he said. We already looked at a couple of verses from chapter six concerning our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to sanctify our bodies for God's purpose and not for our own. So I'm going to read from 
chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, verses 9 through 11. We're to have a change of heart and a direction of life after we become believers. In verse 9, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. This is very similar to what Jesus himself said to the woman who was caught or taken in adultery, and then thrown down on the ground before the Lord as he was teaching in the temple area. How when no man condemned her, when Jesus said, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then he began to write with his finger in the dust or the sand of the ground. And many people speculate that he may have been spelling out the various sins that those guys that brought this woman to Jesus had been guilty of. And so many people think that because of that, none of them threw stones, but one by one they left. And then pretty soon Jesus looked up and no one was there but the woman. And he said, where are those your accusers? Has no man accused you? And she said, no man, Lord. And then he said, neither do I condemn you. And then he said, go and sin no more. In other words, don't continue in the lifestyle that you were in prior to coming to me. Make a decision to live for God and to live for righteousness sake. So what Paul was telling these people were, was, was that they had been involved in all of those heinous sins that we mentioned one right after the other. There are two or three of those that I mentioned that are social justice issues of our day. And they are kind of uh, pet peeves of people that want to point their finger at people that say that the Bible is God's word and say that that is being prejudiced and self-righteous and judgmental. But the people that believe that are not the ones that say it. God himself said it in his word. And he's basically saying that it doesn't make any difference what your sins have been before you come to Christ in faith. Anyone can be saved from any type of lifestyle. But the idea is that Jesus wants us to know that after we trust in him and we're born again, we're not to continue on in a lifestyle that the Bible teaches as sinful. So Paul addressed marriage and relationships in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians and the importance in living in a manner to please the Lord. Chapter 8 addressed our consciousness or our conscience, rather, in not offending other people, especially new believers, by our diet or the things that we eat or drink. Chapter 9 addresses a pattern for self-denial in living in such a manner to receive a crown or, re or a reward when we uh, come before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Chapter 10 explained the Old Testament stories, some of them, and gave them as examples for us to learn from to help us not repeat the same mistakes and the sins that they were guilty of. And then it reminds me of that phrase that we are familiar with. What we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Chapter 11 deals with the institution of the Lord's Supper. Remember how the Lord changed the Passover meal the night that he was betrayed into the Lord's Supper? And he talked about the bread, the broken bread representing his broken body and the wine representing the blood that he shed for the payment of the sins of the world. And he talked about, Paul did in chapter 11, the importance of our examining ourselves before we take part in the Lord's Supper so that we won't have any unconfessed sins before the Lord when partaking of the Lord's Supper. Well, chapters 12, 13, and 14 come next, and that's what we'll look at next week. And they're probably Paul's greatest teaching 
on the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they're quite controversial. They were in his day. In fact, I believe that he had to spend such a great time and to go into such elaborate details about them because the people in Corinth were abusing them and were in error in coveting various gifts. And we'll talk more about that as we look at those three chapters next week. So if you'd like to read ahead, and I would encourage you to read chapters 12, 13, and 14 of the book of 1 Corinthians, and that's where we'll be next week. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for your word and the scriptural principles that are given to us, and how that the Apostle Paul, especially in his writings, encourages us to apply these scriptural principles to our everyday lives. Thank you for those who join us online. I pray for your continued blessings upon them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you join us on the Saturday afternoon study, and we're going to begin a new study this coming Saturday. We finished our study in the book of Revelation last week, and we're going to begin a study that will lead us into learning about the prophecies in the book of Ezekiel about the millennial kingdom. But we're going to start in chapter 33 and work our way into that and find how relevant all of those chapters are to us even in the day in which we live. So if you'd like to read ahead for that, if you can join us on Saturday afternoon, uh, read chapters 33 and 34 of the book of Ezekiel. If you're not able to join us on Saturday, I hope that you have a good Lord's Day and we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, Lord bless you.